Hello, I'm Professor Matthew Cobb of the University of Manchester. And in this mini lecture series, we're going to be looking at human evolution, how it took place, and some of the most astonishing discoveries we've made over the last decade, which have utterly transformed our view of what it is to be human. Now, the first question people want to know is, well, how did we come about? How did we appear? The very simple answer, but it needs a bit of explaining, is through evolution by natural selection. Now, this idea was first put forward by Charles Darwin in the 19th century, and it is very, very simple. Natural selection occurs when you have three conditions. Firstly, heritable characters, that is, something that can be transmitted because it's got a genetic basis down the generations. Secondly, differences between individuals. So you can't get evolution by natural selection if there's no variability. Variation is essential. So if you have a heritable character that is different between individuals, and which leads to what's called differential fitness. Fitness can be seen as survival, the ability to reproduce. If individuals with those different characters have different survivals or different abilities to reproduce, then you get a change in the genetic frequencies from one generation to another. And that is all evolution is. Evolution is a change in gene frequencies and natural selection is this sifting of characters because they're associated with increased survival or ability to reproduce and that over the vast depths of, e of geological time produces changes and produces all the astonishing world we have around us. You have to remember there's no aim no objective to evolution. We are not the point of it all. We are not the high point of evolution. Evolution by natural selection simply occurs where these three characteristics exist. In whatever system, potentially on other worlds, if they have these three characteristics, then they will get evolution by natural selection too. Now, how does it apply to humans? Well, first thing we've got to remember is in terms of talking about species, that a species, from a biologist's point of view, is a group of organisms, a population, that does not interbreed with another group. So, for example, we and chimpanzees are isolated. We, if we can't mate, we can't produce fertile, we can't produce any offspring, never mind fertile offspring. Sometimes you get matings that occur, say, between a horse and a donkey, it produces a mule. But they're still species because the mule is sterile. So if you can produce fertile, spe fertile hybrids when you mate, then you are, by definition, part of the same species. If you can't, then you're a separate species. And species appear primarily, they emerge because a population of organisms become separated, say because of geological activity. One, they live on now two sides of a, a river that has appeared. And they can't, they're not birds. If they're land mammals, for example, they can't get from one side of the river to the other. And you end up with two different species. You can see this, for example, in the Grand Canyon in America where you get different species of land mammal on either side of the canyon, but the same species of bird, which can clearly get over this obstacle. So isolation, random evolutionary geological events produces different species over the depths of geological times. So to emphasize, we are not the point of three billion years of history of life on Earth. We're just one particular very smart ape that has appeared in the last few hundred thousand years. And all of our molecular, fossil, genetic data underline the truth of this. Everything we know about the natural world, about our place in it, is reinforced 
by these discoveries which we're making every day. So although our worldview has been changed in ways that you will see, it is all congruent with our genetic understanding of the DNA that is in all of us. The evidence I'm going to be presenting to you today is all about the genetic data. And sometimes students can find this uh, a bit upsetting because it contradicts their beliefs. But I think you've got to realize if you're a scientist, you can have whatever beliefs you want, that's fine. But you can't use your beliefs to decide what evidence you accept and what you reject. The data are the data, and that's what drives our views. And over the last decade, as we're going to see, DNA, in particular ancient DNA, DNA from extinct groups, has changed our understanding of human evolution. So where do we come from? Well, the very short answer is Africa. We all come from Africa. All humans today can trace their origins back to Africa. We know this from the DNA that we can sequence from people around the world and our population genetics models show that they all converge. Every genome of every human that's alive today converges back in Africa uh, around about 7,000, 70,000 years ago. All humans lived in Africa. It appears that we originated around about 300,000 years ago. That's the latest fossil data. We now suspect that perhaps we left Africa in a number of waves, perhaps earliest about 200,000 years ago. Recent redating of some fossils found in Greece suggests that they were actual modern humans. But if we did leave Africa before 70,000 years ago, those humans died out because every human alive today can trace their origins back to Africa around about 70,000 years ago. That is when we began, some of us began to leave Africa to disperse out to the rest of the world. So it seems that perhaps there were many movements out of Africa, not just one. Perhaps climate change may have driven people to start to move very, very slowly. Let's not think that these were great treks or disper you know, expeditions. This is slow movement around the planet. And the one at about 70,000 years ago is the one that led to all of us who are alive today. So it's not a colonization by brave <laughs> expeditions. It is simply slowly moving around the planet. And all this is supported by our genetics and by our fossil evidence. And we can do, we can see that, in fact, to get out of Africa, this map shows you, simply by walking and occasionally getting in boats, say, to get to Australia, by moving about one kilometre a year, you can spread around the planet. That's all you need to do. You, you're not trying to get to anywhere. You don't know where anywhere is. You're just a group of hunter-gatherers slowly moving around the, populate, around the planet. We now know there's a lot of dispute about when we got to the Americas uh, and how we got there. Did we go up round the top uh, through the frozen wastes of Alaska or did we go by boats via a coastal route? Uh, recent footprints have been discovered in New Mexico that suggest perhaps we got there a bit earlier than was normally thought, maybe 20,000 years ago. But basically, that's how we got around the planet. We walked and occasionally we got on boats. And we can see this in our genes. This is one of my favorite graphs in the whole of biology. In general, biology doesn't do straight lines because you know biology is complicated. Straight lines for physics. But in this case, we've got a lovely straight line. This is showing the heterozygosity, that is the genetic variability of different indigenous peoples around the world. And you can see that it's declining with distance from Africa. So the greatest variability is in Africa, which is what you'd expect. That's where we come from, our ancestral population. They have the largest amount of variability. And the smallest amount of variability is that in the uh, most distant populations, those in the Pacific Oceans. And you can imagine why, because you'll have had a large amount of variation, and then a subgroup of that population moved away. 
So you've got less variation. And then a subgroup of that, and then a subgroup of that. So at each stage, as we've moved, we've gradually reduced genetic variability. Finally, we can see that our existence, our very existence, is incredibly lucky. This figure is taken from six genomes, whole genomes of, indus of, in of indigenous peoples. And what it shows us is that around about 70,000 years ago, there was what's called a bottleneck, a reduction in the size of the human population to around about 12,000 people. That's all there were in Africa, just 12,000 people. That's the arrow you can see on this figure. And it doesn't take much to imagine that disease or famine, who knows what, could have absolutely wiped us out. 12,000 animals today, if you had that in a wild population, you'd be quite concerned about its future. So humans are incredibly lucky.